So today we're gonna to talk about star racer blower belts and installation uh, ideas that I have and we use on Terry McMillan's car to get the maximum amount of runs on our blower belts. And so today I'm just gonna do some basics, go over some things. It may be stuff you all know, but it's things that we do and we have great longevity with our belts. And I just wanna pass some of those things along. There might be just one thing that, that you'll catch throughout this whole thing. And I, I, I really honestly, I hope it helps you. So let's talk about some of the components that actually are uh, tightening this belt up on the engine. We uh, use a DMPE idler bracket. Now there's a lot of different idler brackets out there, but there's manufacturers that make their own as like Coletta and Forces and uh, uh, Richard Hartman makes an awesome one. Anyway, everyone's got their little variations of different things, but the biggest thing is, is that you're able to have three points to describe this plane right here that's gonna be uh, holding the idler in place. And what that is, is uh, another component like this. So what this does is it keeps things from flexing away. And when you just have, a, a, some I've seen alcohol cars and stuff like that, that just have a center bolt that actually goes through here, but they get this deflection as it's going down and it causes the belt to, to run one direction. So this definitely is a better system uh, when you have three points like this to uh, encapsulate the idler. So the next thing we want to talk about is the condition of the components themselves. Now after a while what happens here, is, and they all do this, the anodizing will start coming off and it'll start getting some crap on it, you know what I mean? Some, some transfer from the aluminum off of the, uh, the idler itself, you know, when these become unanodized after time. And what happens is it transfers back and forth. Well one of the biggest things that cause a break in a belt is for the belt to become loose and once it jumps a tooth that's the death of, of the belt right there so if it's breaking you know you know horizontally right across the belt and where you have two flat pieces that just come off and this thing's flapping in the breeze that is a sign that your belt came loose and it could be a you're not getting it tight enough or b the components themselves are garfed up you know on the backhand side you know like this even it comes back down to the post itself you know, look, look at your guys' posts here and make sure these aren't getting garfed up. These are tie and they get, they transfer too. So you wanna keep these all nice and clean and these surfaces flat and clean as you can get. And the next thing you wanna do is come in here on these type of components like this, you know, and just take a flat block on them and get all the high spots off of it. So it has a nice surface to sit against because this is the only thing that's keeping that thing tight. Now, we also know that these systems here actually have the, the dogs that you put in here, um, you know, to keep this thing pressed away, uh, you know, and use this as an adjustment. Now, some teams run two of these, some of them run one. It seems like the two thing is becoming more common. Uh, thing I would like to see actually is uh, a numbering system on these things. So you'll know how much you need to run X in and this one in. And that way you can actually get that idler straight because a lot of times when you're prying on these things to get them tight, you're prying on one side of the idler, right? And so you're getting that thing and it's actually cocked in there and it's not, you know, in alignment. So having these jack screws uh, and a set of dogs for getting these things adjusted properly is, is huge. So next we're gonna talk about the idler pulley. Um, a lot of teams, uh, you know, run a different variety of idlers. Some of them are tapered, some of them are flat, but all in all, you know, was speaking to a lot of uh, technical people who know timing belts, and that's what this is. This is the timing belt. Yeah, it drives our supercharger, isn't necessarily in time, but yeah, it is. We don't want it to skip. And so when you're gonna press against the teeth of a timing belt, you would never do it with a smooth idler. You look at any of the OEMs or any of the high performance cars that are out there, they're not gonna press up against the teeth with something smooth. So you're gonna flatten the teeth and then you're gonna put it through a die roll, you know, on the lower pulley in the top. And so that's not the correct way to do it. The right way to do it is with a toothed idler. And I make a tooth idler and there's a couple little options that I do on mine. I have actually, they're vented basically on the edges actually to help get rid of some of the air that comes in because when the air gets compressed between the teeth and the belt, it actually heats it up and that causes extra heat on the outside edges of the belt, which can actually cause the uh, belt to uh, delaminate a little bit when it's a rubber belt like ours. So the next thing I do is I change the entry of how it comes into the idler itself. It uses a different edge of the belt 
to actually guide it back in in case the alignment is not right. Another thing a tooth idler does is it drives the belt better and keeps it in a line because it's actually working off the teeth, say more so than a smooth belt. Um, some of the components that are inside one of these idlers, you know, are the, uh, the bearings themselves, the uh, uh, centerpiece, which is the distance on it. And what's critical about these things is getting this distance correct. And that distance is for two things. Number one, the distance in between here, because this is a sandwiched uh, idler, has to be correct so it's holding against itself well. But yet the most important thing is the distance that's inside of the idler itself. You know, in the heat of the moment, you know, you're putting this thing together and you're slamming it together. And usually putting the belt on is one of the last things you do before you start the car. You don't necessarily do it in the shop and all that kind of thing. So one thing I suggest that you do is take your idler assembly and put it inside your bracket uh, with it tightened down and look and see how much play you have. If you have play up and down, when it's like this, at this position right here, this thing's gonna have to bend in to actually hold that idler tight. And you don't want that. The way you want it to fit would be something like this, where it's just, just sits in there just nice, just like that. That's how you want it. And then make sure it's even from one side to the other. So when you apply pressure on this to hold this thing tight and in place, you're gonna do it without bending this bracket. Another thing you don't want to happen is, you don't want this thing too tall, so when you suck this thing down, you can't hardly even move your idler, and it's, it's just hard on components. So you wanna make sure that that distance is correct, and how you do that is determined by how thick these are. Now you can take it off the back, it takes the anodizing off. You can take it off of here, um, which will move it also. Um, probably is a better idea to do that, but it's, when you check it up in the lathe and stuff, it's generally just easier enough just to, to do that. But the thing is, is, you take the anodizing off and then you have an issue, you know, on your components because now you have a bare piece of aluminum. So check that all out, make sure that that fits correct. And that's also gonna help with your tracking issues. Now, another thing that we do with our manifolds is that we machine our manifolds with an angle. And what we do is we try and incorporate the front of the manifold up four tenths of a degree. Generally, you can take about 85 to 89 thousandths, place it under the back of the manifold, put it in the machine, and remachine the top of the manifold so that the blower is actually kind of pointed up. Because when that blower is on there and it's running, it's simulating having like 3,000 pounds on the nose of that thing pulling down on it. So anything you can do to counteract that without having to put a bunch of adjustment in it uh, definitely helps make the belt run truer as it's going down the racetrack. So let's install a belt. So for uh, purposes today, um, and we've actually ran this width of belt before, but this is half of width of a, of a normal Star Racer belt. Um, this is an inch and a half. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna put this belt on with a regular idler and we're gonna rotate the motor over and we're gonna show different things that affect the way that this thing tracks as it's uh, being spun over. So we're gonna go ahead and put this thing together. So once you have the manifold bolted down, everything's tight, the belt's still loose, you wanna adjust your jack screws. First thing is you wanna run them down to zero. And then zero is just the matter of of when they start touching. My hand's fine. Now in your particular systems you want to look at, you may have one jack screw that's standing up more than the other one. And we try and make ours even um, as far as the V coming up to support that. So ours pretty much is determined by where we locate this um, as far as how it's pushing up on that. So if you have one that's straight, and then one that's coming from the side, you think that about it, this thing is being side loaded this way a little bit. So to have one on this side is not a bad idea. Having one straight also is not a bad idea, but what happens is when people do these jack screws, what determines if this belt's running forward or not is how much jack screws in this. So it's something that you have to, to actually uh, experiment with a little bit, but you need to do it in a methodical way. Now, this thing's gonna run just like a belt sander. So anyway, what we do is I'll take the straightest one and I'll adjust that one first. And so we'll have maybe uh, two flats in, two flats on that one. And the thing is, is now this, this one's loose. Now, you don't wanna just sit here and run it down and then run two flats into it. You wanna run it up to it and maybe just add one flat to it to where this one's still tight. So you don't wanna jack it out of alignment, you know? So 
record that what you did and then watch the belt when it runs and then you just tighten those puppies back down and there you go all of our idlers are marked in and out we want to put them on the same way every time there is offset sometimes in the uh the bracket so that's what we do So these are the pucks that we use to space out the distance when we're using this jack screw to press the idler down. So what we have is like a 3 8 uh, all thread basically with a nut on the end of it. And basically we're going to run this down and that's what's going to push the idler down in order to get the tension right. Now when you're tensioning this thing up, get this thing piano string tight. I'm telling you. This motor doesn't grow but 30 some thousandths in height. So all that bullshit about how it's gonna grow and you need to get into it and all that kind of thing as far as the distance goes, it's all bullshit. Throw that off to the side. The worst thing you can have is a loose belt. Now, once the idler jack screw has been pushed down, I'm gonna take the front side of the idler and I'm just gonna make it nice and square. I push it back and forth till it finds its little home and then I'll tighten it up at that point. I'm not gonna force it one direction or the other. I'm just bringing it back towards in its neutral spot. Now, if you have two jack screws, of course, you can run that thing down there and get that even. But you gotta be really careful because you can jack one side of it away from the motor or towards it. I'll go ahead and spin the motor a couple times and I'll recheck the tension on it just to make sure. But also, I'm gonna watch that belt and what it's doing as I'm spinning this thing around make sure that I don't have anything completely out of line. I'll finish off by tightening the jack screw lock nut to make sure that it's not gonna back off during the run. Now, in between rounds, it's always two people usually doing this. And, you know, you know, I get this good system together because your guy needs to be able to pry just right. And you also need to make sure when you are doing the two jack screws on the front of the blower on the, on the extension that you're doing them the same every time. And then make those adjustments if that belt looks like dog shit, right? You know, if it's running off the front, put a little more jack screw in it next time. See what it does. Now, I deliberately adjusted this idler. I pried it out so it's towards the mags, and then I'm gonna spin this thing around. So what it should do is really run towards the uh, motor itself, the belt. You can definitely see it work its way back there. So basically, when I run this knob in, that's lifting, we're gonna pretend like this is the snout of the blower, that's lifting the front of this up on this side of this flat pulley. So we'll see what she's doing. When I run it in, you can see which way it makes it move. Pull it back out. Same thing, it'll run off the front, hit this edge, if it's too low, if it's too high, it'll run it the other way. You know, another thing that we do is that we actually put some of this on the edge of the belt. Now, this is a uh, basically like a silicone, but it does have like ceramic solids in it and it extends the life of the belt. Anything you can do to make it a little bit slicker on the sides is gonna help things. But in your Napa's, all your auto zones, places like that, this is actually made to lubricate the pin slides on um, a hydraulic or on um, regular disc brakes and so get you a can of this it doesn't take a whole lot but man does it really save things another thing that we'll do in the pit is after the warm-up we'll measure this side and this side of the belt with the temperature gun right after it shuts off to see if one's not hotter than the other and that'll tell you which way it's really trying to to um, run also you'll notice when it runs it probably should go towards the back when it's idling and when you shut it off and it's winding back down, it'll probably go back towards the front. 
And you got to understand, when it's under load, again, it's like hanging 3,000 pounds on the front of this. So when it's idling and things, it's probably going to look like it's running back just a touch. But when it's on a run and it's being pulled down, it should be nice and even and keep those edges of your belt looking good. So what's going to determine a belt uh, to run it or not? The last run on this belt, it had a hole out from the step. It went like um, 89 or something like that last year at Indy or whatever. And you can see here, it actually tried to take some teeth off this thing. Um, this here, we would deem that not runnable. You can definitely see where it got after it. You wanna look also here, and a little bit of cord coming out on the side is okay. Just come in there and give that damn thing a haircut. But if you see a big delamination like, like this right here going on, like right here, that's time to go ahead and throw that belt away. And of course, if it's missing teeth, but say normally it's just looking like this. Say you got some, some fiber hairs hanging out like that. Just come in and give the damn thing a haircut. Just give it a haircut and keep on growing. As long as this big cord's not pulling out of this thing and it's delaminating on the edge, it's good to go. Also, you'll want to look at is the color on the inside of the belt. It'll tell you which way it's running also. It'll be darker on one side than it will the other. When it's running right, it'll have a nice even color across it like this. And you can look, and this thing's got, uh, let's see here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So it's got uh, basically um, 10 runs on it, 11 runs on it. The last one just wasn't that good. Uh, this belt here, um, when it was last ran, this thing here had one, two, three, four, five, six runs on it. The last run, it says oiled heavily. That's not something the guy's proud of. It wasn't my fault, but that's all right. Anyway, you can definitely see it's darker. As a matter of fact, when you wipe your hands like that, um, I wouldn't run this belt either. You know, I wouldn't even suggest cleaning it or anything like that. So if you've ever had a, an injury like that, you can actually see there's some aluminum that's embedded in it also. So anyway, those kind of belts, um, you'd probably want to get rid of those. But anyway, don't worry about a little straggler, you know, cord hanging off the side. Worry about the teeth, what they look like. Worry about the main cord, what it looks like in the side of the belt and to make sure it's not delaminating. Other than that, just keep running those pricks. Now let's talk about our competitor good. compared to us. Our competitor's belt's made out of plastic. Yep, that's right, plastic. Same crap as a big pin. They have to coat the teeth with a Teflon coating to keep them from sticking to the actual pulley because when it gets hot, it actually melts. The Star Racer has a low friction tooth fabric coating that takes less horsepower to actually drive because it has less friction. And it's made out of rubber, which makes it a vibration dampener. I hope the information today I've provided has helped you guys out some. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can always email me at onetracksolution at gmail.com. And if you see me at the track, just don't hesitate to grab me and uh, we'll check out and see what you got going on. Appreciate all the business. Thank you.